Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, we're there in Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one, and like we've been announcing this morning, I'm preaching on the subject, a very specific subject. Uh, the title of the sermon is uh, Psychopath Reprobates. Psychopath Reprobates. And we're, we're, you say, what does that mean, or what is that, the point of that? And the, the point of the sermon, and I'll kind of give you the, 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 the point of what we're trying to accomplish with this sermon, is I want to explain how the biblical teaching of reprobates uh, basically explains the modern epidemic of psychopaths. And this morning, uh, the sermon is going to be more of an introduction to kind of lay a foundation to the teaching of psychopaths, because most of you probably don't know a lot about psychopaths or what the experts tell us about them. And we're also going to be an introduction to the teaching of reprobates, because most Christians, unfortunately, don't know uh, about the doctrine of reprobates or what that means. And really tonight, we're going to dig into the characteristics that both psychopaths and reprobates share. So I want to encourage you to come back tonight as we look at the characteristics and we go through that list there tonight, this morning, we're going to more look at an introduction and kind of get you acquainted with the idea of psychopath reprobates. So psychopath reprobates, how the biblical teaching of reprobates explain the modern uh, epidemic of psychopaths. And I want to start off by just talking about the character of reprobates and psychopaths, really starting off by defining the terms. What is a reprobate? What is a psychopath. Now we're there in Romans chapter number one, and Romans one is really the quintessential passage on the doctrine of reprobates. Now, reprobate doctrine is taught all throughout Scripture, and we're going to look at a lot of uh, Scriptures this morning, but Romans 1 is probably the key uh, place where we learn about reprobates. So let's answer this question. What is a reprobate? We see the teaching here in Romans chapter 1. And I want you to understand, we, we could do an entire s a sermon just on the subject of reprobates, and I, I, I'm going to try not to do that this morning. I want to try to go through that as quickly as we can, but I want you to notice three key elements in regards to a reprobate. Number one, one, you need to understand that they were exposed to and had an opportunity to receive the truth. These are not people who never had an opportunity to get saved, who never had an opportunity to hear the truth. They were at one point exposed to the truth. They were at one point, they did at one point have an opportunity to receive the truth. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse number 18. Romans 1.18. The Bible says this, For the wrath of God, notice these words, is revealed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. I want you to notice there, the, the idea is that heaven or nature reveals the wrath of God. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Notice this phrase, who hold the truth. So notice, it's not that they don't have the truth. It's not that they never were exposed to the truth. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. Notice verse 19, because that which Notice these words, may be known of God, notice, is manifest in them. I want you to notice that word in there. It says it's manifest in them. You say, what is that referring to? Because first he says that it's revealed from heaven, from the outward nature manifests the, the glory of God. But then it says that it's also revealed in them. For God hath showed it unto them. You say, what is that a reference to? That is a reference to your conscience. And we're going to be talking a lot about the conscience this morning. Keep your, we're going to come back to Romans chapter 1, but just flip one page over to Romans chapter number 2 just real quickly. And let's look at the biblical teaching of a conscience. Romans chapter 2, look at verse number 14. Romans 2, 14, the Bible says this, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, now notice, it's talking about the Gentiles who were not given the oracles of God. They were not given the law of God. They were not given the word of God. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, notice what the Bible says, do by nature, I want you to remember those words, by nature, the things contained in the law, these having not the law, notice, are a law unto themselves. Notice verse 15, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. You say, what is that talking about? It's talking about the fact that God has put in the hearts of men, in the minds of men, a conscience that even when they do not have the laws of God, even in, in cultures and societies where they may have never read the Ten Commandments, they know it's wrong to kill. 
They know it's wrong to steal. They know God has put a conscience inside of man that basically reveals to them the fact that there is someone that they are accountable to. There are things that are right and that are wrong. It says there, having not the law are a law unto themselves. The law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. That's what Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, if you want to flip back to verse 1, when it says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So I want you to notice that these people have been exposed to the truth. They have a conscience inside of them that tells them that there is a God. And by the way, people don't, by nature, believe that there is no God. They have to be taught that there is no God. By nature, people believe in a God. They believe they might not know about the God of the Bible. They might not know about the Lord Jesus Christ. But in them, in their heart, is put the consciousness that comes from God. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. See, the invisible things of God are clearly seen. You say, how? Being understood by the things that are made by creation, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are, notice these words, without excuse. Notice verse 21. Because that, notice these words, when they knew God. So it's not that they never knew God. It's not that they weren't exposed to God. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. So what, what do we need to understand about the reprobates, uh, the doctrine of reprobate? Well, number one, these people were exposed to the truth. These people were uh, 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 taught the truth. They understood the truth. God revealed himself through nature. God reveals himself through, uh, through their conscience. And, and, and these people have had the opportunity to know the truth. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. But here's what you need to understand. Here's the other characteristic of a reprobate is that they choose to resist or the Bible says, deny, reject the truth over and over again. Look at verse 21 again, Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they knew God, notice, they glorified Him not as God. So they knew God, but they chose to glorify Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look at verse 23. And change the truth of, uh, uh, excuse me, verse 23, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So notice, they changed the glory of God into an image made like to corruptible man. Look at verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Remember, they had the truth, they hold the truth, but they changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Look at verse 20. And even as, now what does that mean? That means in the same way that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So it's not that they did not have God in their knowledge. It's not that they were not aware of God or had an opportunity uh, to believe on God or believe uh, the truth. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I want you to notice the third element of a reprobate, even as or in the same way that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You say, what's the third element? It's number three, is God eventually chooses to reject them. See, they are exposed to the truth. They have an opportunity to receive the truth. They choose to reject the truth. And then eventually, after them doing that over and over and over again, God eventually chooses to reject them. And they become a reprobate. Look at verse 21 again. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Look at verse uh, 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24. Wherefore. Is that word wherefore? Wherefore means for that reason, for this reason. What reason? Because they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Wherefore, for that reason, God also, don't miss these words, gave them up. You say, well, God never gives up on anybody. Well, he gave them up, he gave up on these people. Amen. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, to the lust of their own lust, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Notice, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, 
For this cause. For what cause? Because they changed the truth of God into a lie. For this cause, God gave them up. I don't think we should ever give up. Well, God gave up. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, what does the word reprobate mean? Because we're talking about the reprobate doctrine. What does the word reprobate mean? Well, you know, the Bible serves as its own dictionary. We should always allow the Bible to define itself. Before we go to other dictionaries and other sources, we should allow the Bible to define itself. And the Bible tells us what the word reprobate means. Go to the book of Jeremiah in your Bible. Jeremiah chapter number 6. Towards the end of the Old Testament, you got those big major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Find Jeremiah chapter 6 and look at verse 30. Let's quickly look at the definition of the word reprobate. Reprobate. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 30. Because in Romans 1, 28, he says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. What does that mean? Jeremiah 6, 30. Notice what the Bible says. In Jeremiah 6, 30. Reprobate silver shall men call them. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Reprobate silver shall men call them because the Lord hath rejected them. Now, you say, why does it say reprobate silver? The analogy that's being used here is that when they would uh, purify silver and they would heat it up, all of the, uh, the, 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 the things that were unusable, that were good for nothing, would, would surface up and they would remove that, that top layer as they would purify the silver and they would say it was reprobate silver. They would say it was silver that was good for nothing. It was useless. It was only meant to be rejected. And here he says, when people call someone, he says, they're going to call them reprobate silver. Here's what he's saying. When someone calls a man a reprobate, it's because the Lord hath rejected them. What is the Bible telling us the word reprobate means? It means to be rejected. It means that they're rejected of God. You, so when God in Romans 1.28, when the Bible says God gave them over to a reprobate mind, it's because the Lord hath rejected them. See, but you say, well, I, God, you know, I thought anybody could be saved. Listen to me, anybody can be saved. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And everybody has the opportunity to be saved. Sometimes you talk about the reprobate doctrine and people say, well, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But please don't miss the first element of a reprobate. They had an opportunity to be saved. It's not that they, we're not Calvinists here, where we're saying, well, they're born reprobate and they can never be saved. No, they had the opportunity to be saved. They had the opportunity to believe. They had the opportunity. They were exposed to the truth. They understood the truth. They chose to deny it. They chose to reject it over and over again. And listen to me, eventually you can cross a line right. where God Amen. will reject you. Right. The word reprobate, according to the Bible, means rejected. But here's what's interesting. You know, we, we first look at the Bible definition, right? Because the Bible is the authority. But I decided to just look up the word reprobate in the dictionary. Because, you know, today you have Christians who fight us on this doctrine. And they'll say, oh, I can't believe that you would teach that God would give up, to, uh, give up on anybody. Well, have you not read Romans 1? I can't believe that you would think that God, you know, would ever just say that people can't be saved. You know, so I looked up the definition of the word reprobate. And listen to me, I didn't look it up in some theological dictionary Okay, I didn't look it up in some commentary defining the word. I looked it up on dictionary.com. All right, now I don't, I don't know, I don't know a lot about dictionary.com, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think the website's ran by independent Baptists. All right, I don't think it's ran by extreme fundamentalists. And when you type in the word reprobate, it gives you two definitions because you know often when you look up a word in a dictionary, you get several definitions. Here are the two definitions that come up under dictionary.com for the word reprobate. Number one. A depraved, unprincipled, or wicked person. Number two, a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation. Now, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting that dictionary.com understands that the word reprobate means a person rejected by God and beyond hope of salvation, but the average independent Baptist today can't figure out the, what the word reprobate means. See, I want you to say, you say, well, I thought we were going to talk about psychopaths, and we're going to get to that. But I want you to understand what a reprobate is. It's someone who had the opportunity, who heard the truth, who was exposed to the truth. They chose to reject it. They chose to deny it. And eventually they were, as dictionary.com says, rejected by God and beyond the hope of salvation. 
And see, you say, well, that's only Romans 1. Maybe you're misinterpreting Romans 1. Okay, well, let's look at other passages where the reprobate doctrine is taught. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. If you find the T books in the New Testament, they're all clustered together. You got 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now, the passages we're going to go to, you might, it might be a good idea for you to put a ribbon or a bookmark or something there because we're going to come back to these passages. And I want to show you how the doctrine of reprobates is taught throughout Scripture, but I specifically want you to notice that it's taught in the passages we're going to look at, 2 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 2 Peter 2, and Jude. The reason for that is because tonight we're going to come back and look at the characteristics of a reprobate as they are listed for us in the passages we're going to turn to right now. Uh, so I want you to understand that these passages are talking about reprobates. I'll prove it to you right now. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse 1. This know also that in the last days. Now it's interesting. There's always a, re a reference to end times when you're talking about reprobates. I believe the reason for that is because the closer we get to the end, the more that reprobates will abound. And I believe that's actually the reference that we see there when it talks about a great falling away where many people will be rejected. And we know that the climax of the Antichrist government is the mark of the beast, which when someone takes it, what do they become? A reprobate. They're no longer able to be saved. Look at uh, 2 Timothy 3.1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Four, notice, four men. Four men shall be lovers of their own selves. Now here's what I want you to understand. He's telling us perilous times shall come for 2 Timothy 3.2. He says, because of men, and he's going to start describing these men to us. He says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of others that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. We're going to come back to all of those tonight when we look at the characteristics of a psychopath reprobate. But look at verse 5. I want you to notice how this passage is dealing with reprobates. Having a form of godliness. So notice, they were exposed to the truth. In fact, they even pretend to have the truth. And by the way, a lot of these reprobates will pretend to be saved. Having a form of godliness, notice though, but, don't, don't miss this word, but denying the power thereof. A common element with the reprobates is that they choose to reject. They choose to deny. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. Notice verse 7. Notice what the Bible says in verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Notice, these people have been rejected. They, they have a form of godliness. They've been exposed to the truth. They've been exposed to God. They deny the power thereof, and they're ever learning. Look, they can go to college. They can go to Bible college. They can go to seminary. They can go to church. They can be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, notice, so do these also resist the truth. They deny the truth. They resist the truth. They reject the truth. Men of corrupt minds, don't miss this, reprobate concerning the faith. So look, 2 Timothy 3 is talking about reprobates. These men are rejected concerning the faith. They have a form of godliness. They've been exposed to godliness, but they deny the power thereof. They're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They resist the truth. And they are reprobate concerning the faith. Keep your place there in 2 Timothy. We're going to come back to this passage. But go to Titus, the next book over. Titus, chapter number 1. Here's another passage dealing with reprobates. And notice that in 2 Timothy, we see there that there is a list of characteristics given. It's interesting, when God talks about reprobates in the Bible, He always gives us a list of characteristics. There's a list of characteristics in Romans 1. There's a list of characteristics in 2 Timothy 3. Notice Titus chapter 1, verse 10. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Now we're talking here about false prophets. So how do you know that they are reprobates? Well, look at verse 12. We'll, we'll keep going through the passage. One of them, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, notice, that turn from the truth. Notice, 
The, the, the underlying element is that they deny the truth. They reject the truth. They resist the truth. Here, the Bible says, they turn from the truth unto the pure. All things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. Verse 16, they pro, uh, profess that they know God. Yeah, but I got one of these reprobates saved. Hey, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. Notice, they know God. They're exposed to the truth. It's not that they didn't have an opportunity to see the truth. They profess that they know God, but in works they, again, deny Him. Deny Him. Resist the truth. Reject the truth. Turn from the truth. Being abominable, doesn't that sound like a reprobate? And disobedient, notice what the Bible says, and unto every good work, here's our key word, reprobate. Unto every good work, rejected. So notice, we saw in 2 Timothy 3 that the subject is on reprobates. We see here in Jude that the subject is on reprobates, and he goes on and gives us more of description. We'll come back to that later on. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. You're there in Titus. You're going to go past Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 2 Peter. I, I, we're going to get off the thing on reprobates here in a second, but I just want to lay a sure foundation so you understand what we're talking about when we're talking about reprobates. 2 Peter chapter 2 is another place where we learn about reprobates. Notice what the Bible says. But there were false prophets. Notice that there is a reference to false prophets. That's going to come back later. Also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers. So you got false prophets, false teachers among you. Among who? Among believers. Who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. Even, notice the consistency, denying the Lord that bought them. They deny, they resist, they turn, they reject. And notice they, the fact that they've been rejected and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Notice what the Bible says. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. These people have been rejected. Notice that in verses 4, 5, and 6, he gives us examples of others who have been rejected. Notice what he says. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Skip down to verse 17 for sake of time. 2 Peter 2.17. These are wells without water. Who, who are the these? Those are the, the false prophets, the false teachers. These are wells without water. The same people that were compared to the angels that sinned against God, that turned on God. The same people that were compared to the old world that God destroyed with Noah's flood. The same people that were compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, these are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest. Notice what it says, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These people have no hope. They have a reservation already made for their condemnation, for their judgment. Go to Jude. You're there in 2 Peter. You're going to go past 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John into the book of Jude, Jude chapter 1. Here's another passage talking about reverence. I just want, you say, why are you doing that? Because people, because if I, I teach it on Romans 1, here's what people will say. Oh, well, you're misinterpreting Romans 1. I don't know how you can interpret, misinterpret Romans 1 when three times he says, gave them up, gave them up, gave them over. Amen. I don't know how you can misinterpret Romans 1 when he says he gave them over to a reprobate mind, which the Bible, even dictionary.com, understands means you're rejected and without hope of salvation. But look, it's taught throughout the Bible. We saw it in 2 Timothy, saw it in Titus, we saw it in 2 Peter. Let's look at it in Jude, Jude chapter 1. Uh, uh, there's only one chapter, Jude 1. Look at verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Notice, they're always crept in unawares. They're, they're among us. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Notice, who were before of old ordained to the, this condemnation. Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. What does it mean to be ordained? Usually we use the word ordained in a positive sense. Talking about the fact that we ordain a man to the ministry. What does that mean? It means that that individual is set apart for the ministry of God. The Bible tells us that these men are ordained or set apart to this condemnation. Ungodly men. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. Don't miss it. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice. 
It's not that they couldn't, is that they didn't have the opportunity to get saved. They have the opportunity, they just deny him. They turn away, they resist it, they reject it. Verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now he goes into, because uh, this is a parallel passage with 2 Peter 2, which we just saw. He starts giving us examples of people that have been rejected. Verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal uh, fire, verse 8, likewise. What's that mean? In the same way. In the same way as who? As the angels which kept not their first estate, that hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, that are reserved uh, in everlasting chains under darkness. In the same way, likewise to Sodom and Gomorrah, which were an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. He says, likewise, also these Filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Verse 12, these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit wither it, without fruit. Now he's given us all these characteristics. We're going to come back to that. But I want you to notice what he says about these people. He says, twice dead. Now what does that mean, twice dead? Well, you know, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is dead. The Bible says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, when somebody uh, dies the first death, the initial death, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to die and go to hell. Because if you are born again, listen to me, everybody's born physically once. Everybody, unless you live to the rapture, is going to die physically once. But then you get a choice. You either get born again or you die again. You either get born again and don't experience the second death, or you choose not to get born again and you experience the second death, which is the lake of fire. And notice what the Bible says about these people. They haven't even died physically yet, and they're already twice dead. Why? Because they don't even have the option to be born again. It's like they're already experienced the, the lake of fire. They're already experienced the second death. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots, waging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. These are reprobates. What are the elements? They've been exposed to the truth. They've heard the truth. They hold the truth of God in unrighteousness. And then they choose to deny the truth, to turn away from the truth, to resist the truth, to reject the truth. And eventually, God rejects them. Now, it's important to identify that Romans 1, 2 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 2 Peter 2, and Jude are all passages dealing with reprobates. Because we're going to come back to see how the characteristics in those same passages of reprobates described in those passages match the characteristics that psychiatrists have identified in psychopaths. But let me just say this. You know, this doctrine of reprobates, people try to act like, oh, you guys just came up with that. You're out to lunch. You're just these kooky, backward, extreme fundamentalists. You know, you guys, you guys made this up. No one's ever believed that. But listen to me very carefully. Christians have believed the doctrine of reparates through history. There is no new thing under the sun. This is something that people have believed, uh, that believers have believed from the Word of God. And I want to give you just one example of that. Because, you know, the independent fundamental Baptists will attack us for believing this. And they'll say, we can't believe you believe in reprobate. We can't believe that you believe that God would give up on anybody, that God would reject anybody, that anybody could cross the line and no longer be able to be saved. We can't believe that you would believe that. But let me just bring you up one example. There's a man who I actually, you know, think was a good man. He's passed away now by the name of Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles pastored the largest independent Baptist church during his lifetime. He pastored a church with over 10,000 people in it. He had big ministry, successful pastor. He was the founder and chancellor of the largest independent fundamental Baptist Bible college, Hiles Anderson College. Now, I don't necessarily recommend Bible colleges, but I'm just telling you, this guy was a founder and chancellor of the most successful IFB Bible college during his lifetime, Hiles Anderson College. He was a sought-out speaker. He was a guest preacher in every uh, he, he, he was a guest preacher in churches in every state of the union. He preached in every state of the union, almost every year, all across the world. He was, during his lifetime, the undisputed leader of fundamentalism. 
He was not some kook in a corner. He was not some, you know, uh, just you know, young guy out to lunch. This guy was, I mean, you cannot get more mainstream IFB than Jack Hiles. And I want you to notice or understand that Jack Hiles clearly taught the doctrine of reprobates. I'm going to read to you an excerpt from one of his sermons, all right? Listen to his words. Please listen to me. I'm going to come to some very serious territory right now. Don't miss this. Don't miss it. Let me warn you. Please, let me warn you. There is a line drawn over which you cannot be saved. If you think that you can just wait until you die, and on your death you can come to Christ, you've got another thing coming. Here your life is, out yonder somewhere. I don't know where. There is a line. I don't know where it is, but that line is drawn. And when you cross over that line, from that moment forward, you will never have a chance to be saved. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 24, it says, God gave them up. Are you listening? God gave them up. Now, one of these days, you're going to hear the gospel for the last time, and you're going to say no, and God is still going to have someone knock on someone else's door, and he'll not knock on your door anymore. In Romans 1.26, it says, God gave them up. In Romans 1.28, it says, God gave them over. In Genesis 6.3, my spirit shall not always strive with man. In Ephesians 4.19, who being past feeling have given themselves over, end quote. That was Jack Hiles. That was the the most sought-out preacher in the independent fundamental Baptist movement, and he clearly taught that there's a line drawn, and when you cross it, you can no longer be saved. And he taught it out of Romans 1. And today, the independent fundamental Baptist, who will have pictures of this man in their foyers, who will, you know, name auditoriums after him and say this is their hero, they look at us and say, you guys are out to lunch. You guys are extremists. It's because you didn't go to Bible college. You're uneducated. That Nobody believes that. Well, your hero did. Well, your leader did. I, you say, why are you reading? I'm just explaining to you. This is not something that we came up with. This is not something that we made up. This is a belief that Christians, mainstream Christians, have believed in the history of Christianity. So what is a reprobate? It's someone who's been exposed to the truth. They've had an opportunity to have the truth. They chose to deny, reject, resist, turn away from the truth. And God eventually rejects them, gives them over to a reprobate mind. Now, what is a psychopath? What is a psychopath? Because today we are uh, teaching on the subject of of a psychopath. Now, let me go ahead and and, and, kind of introduce to you a man by the name of Robert D. Hare. He's a PhD. He's a psychiatrist, and he wrote this book, Without a Conscience. Now, when we talk about reprobates, I'm going to be getting all of my proof from the Word of God. When we talk about psychopaths, I'm going to be getting all of my proof from this book. And the reason I want to do that is because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want to go to the expert in regards to psychopathy. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about Robert D. Hare, Ph.D. And and he doesn't, you know, I don't know him, he doesn't know me, and I don't know that he would, um, you know, uh, agree with with what we believe. We're just using his book because he is, Dr. Hare is the leading expert on psychopathy today. He created a tool called the Psychopathy Checklist, which is a tool used by medical professionals and law enforcement agencies throughout the world to reliably diagnose a psychopath. I want to read to you just a little bit from the uh, excerpt from from the part of the book about the author, uh, where it talks about Robert Hare. It says this in his book on psychopathy. It says, in recognition of the enormous impact that his work on psychopathy has had worldwide, the Society of the Scientific Study of Psychopathy named their Lifetime Achievement Award after him. So the people who study psychopathy for a living have a Lifetime Achievement Award, and they named it the Robert D. Hare Award, okay? I'm just, you say, why are you telling us? I just want you to know, when we're reading from this book, we are reading from the world-renowned expert on psychopathy. I mean, if you want, if you look up psychopathy or psychopath documentaries, you're often going to see this book referenced. You're going to see this guy interviewed. This guy is the world expert when it comes to the secular view of psychopaths. Now, what does he say a psychopath is? What is a psychopath according to the expert? Well, here's what he says in his book. He says, psychopaths are social predators who charm, manipulate, and ruthlessly plow their way through life, leaving a broad trail of broken hearts, shattered expectations, and empty wallets. Completely lacking in conscience and in feelings for others, they selfishly take what they want and do as they please, violating social norms and expectations without the slightest sense of guilt 
or regret. Now, here's what you need to understand about psychopaths, okay? Because usually when you use the term psychopath, people think a crazy man. They think somebody who's insane. They think of somebody who's, who's uh, you know, foaming at the mouth or whatever. And here's what you need to understand. Psychopaths are not insane. They are not crazy. Here's what uh, he wrote in page five. Psychopathic killers, however, are not mad. According to the accepted legal and psychiatric standards, their acts result not from a deranged mind, but from a cold, calculating rationality combined with a chilling inability to treat others as thinking, feeling human beings. Here's what he wrote on page 22. Psychopaths are not disoriented or out of touch with reality, nor do they experience the delusions, hallucinations, or intense subjective distress that characterize most other mental disorders. Psychopaths are rational and aware of what they are doing and why. Their behavior is the result of choice, freely exercise. So I want you to understand, these people, these psychopaths, they're not crazy, they're not deranged. They understand right and wrong. They understand what they're doing. Now, you might ask, well, why are you preaching a sermon called Psychopath Reprobates? And this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the connection between a reprobate and a psychopath. Because as I was studying psychopaths, here's what I basically came to the conclusion. Wow, these people are just talking about what the Bible calls a reprobate. You know, the scientists say there's people out there, we call them psychopaths. Well, the Bible talks about these same people that are called reprobates. Now, you say, well, what connects? What makes you think that these psychopaths are reprobates are one in the, and the same? Well, go, go, to, go back to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. Now, let me say this. I don't necessarily think that everybody they diagnose as psychopath is a reprobate in the sense that they've got a, a psychopathy checklist that has a... A, a big, you know, there's, there's a big spectrum as to what they consider psychopaths. And I think you could be on the lower parts of that uh, spectrum and, and not be a reprobate. But here's what I believe. I believe that when someone is, uh, is diagnosed as a pure psychopath, this person is a psychopath. They don't have the traits of a psychopath. Not that they might be a psychopath. When they are a pure psychopath, they are what the Bible calls a reprobate. And you say, well, why? Well, here's what you need to understand. When the Bible speaks about reprobates, it emphasizes the mind of a reprobate. Are you there in Romans 1? Look at verse 28. And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate. Notice, it doesn't say soul. It doesn't say body. It, does, it says he gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And after, and, and uh, let me read it again, Romans 1, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. When the Bible emphasizes the idea of a reprobate, it emphasizes the fact that their mind is a reprobate mind. Their mind has been rejected. You see that throughout the passages on reprobates. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Remember I told you to keep your place there? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 8. 2 Timothy 3, 8. Notice what the Bible says. Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these. Remember, I already proved to you that these are the repro uh, reprobates. We looked at the passage. So do these also resist the truth. Notice what it says. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So when we talk about reprobates in the Bible, what does he say? He says they have a reprobate mind. What does he say? He says they are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith. Uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, just one book forward. 1 Timothy 4. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he's talking about false prophets. Remember we saw that in the passages on reprobates already? False prophets, false teachers. Notice what he says about reprobates, these false prophet reprobates in 1 Timothy 4.1. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Spirit uh, speaketh expressly that in the latter times, remember 2 Timothy 3, it said, in the last days, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And by the way, whenever you see doctrines of devils, children of the devil, children of Beelzebub, children of Belial, those are all reprobates. All right? And, and even, even when you see the psycho, uh, psychopath serial killers, a lot of them are Satan worshipers. Notice what he says, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. 
Okay, so when we talk about reprobates in the Bible, what do we see? We see that they've been given over to a reprobate mind. We see that they are men of corrupt minds. We see that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Go to Titus chapter number 1. You're there in First Timothy. You're going to go past Second Timothy into Titus. Titus chapter number 1. Notice how Titus brings all of this together. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Notice what the Bible says. Titus 1.15. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Notice the connection there between their mind and their conscience being defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So notice how the Bible continues to emphasize having their mind and conscience defiled, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, men of corrupt minds, men of a reprobate mind. When you talk about reprobate in the Bible, what's often emphasized is their mind, their lack of conscience. Well, when you talk to the experts about psychopathy, what's often emphasized is their mind, any lack of conscience. Let me prove it to you. Well, number one, the book written by the expert is called Without Conscience, The Disturbing World of Psychopaths Among Us. I mean, the number one characteristic of psychopaths is that they have a conscience here with a hot iron. Hmm, doesn't that sound like a reprobate? Is that their minds are corrupt, that their mind and their conscience is corrupt. Now, here's what he wrote about these psychopaths on page one. He said this, he, to he tells this story. Several years ago, two graduate students and I submitted a paper to a scientific journal. The paper described an experiment in which we had used a biomedical recorder to monitor electrical activity in the brain of several groups of adult men while they performed a language task. The activity was traced on chart paper as a series of waves referred to as an electroencephalogram, or EEG. The editor returned our paper with his apologies. His reason, he told us, frankly, we found some of the brain wave patterns depicted in the paper very odd. Those EEGs couldn't have come from real people. See, when they take these people that have actually been diagnosed as pure psychopaths, and they put them you know, into an MRI, they look at how their brain works, they look at how their brain actually thinks, and they compare it to people that are not psychopaths, they have found that their brains actually work differently. When they have them, you know, talk about things that normally bring up a lot of emotion and maybe guilt in a normal person, in a psychopath, those emotions are not seen in their minds. They actually have a different brain. Here's what he wrote on page 75. For psychopaths, the social experience that normally build a conscience never takes hold. Such people don't have an inner voice to guide them. They know the rules, but follow only those they choose to follow, no matter what the repercussions for others. They have little resistance to temptation, and their transgressions elicit no guilt. Without the shackles of a nagging conscience, they feel free to satisfy their needs and wants and do whatever they think they can get away with. See, when you talk to the experts about a psychopath, say, what's the number? If you've got to give me one number one characteristic of a psychopath, what is it? They'll tell you they're without conscience. Well, you know what? If you need one characteristic for a reprobate, you know what it is? Is that they've been going, given over to a reprobate mind. Is that their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Is that they are men of corrupt minds. Is that their minds and their conscience are defiled. Now, let me just deal with this real quickly. What about sociopaths? People often ask, you know, what about a psychopath versus a sociopath? And a lot of people don't understand the differences, and many even... even uh, the experts will use the terms interchangeably, but here's what you need to understand about the, the difference, and this comes from the, the expert on, on psychopathy and uh, about the disorder of, of being a sociopath. The main difference that you need to understand, before I read this quote, the main difference between a psychopath and a sociopath is that a sociopath has a conscience, can feel guilt, remorse, empathy, and build relationships with others. Now, outwardly, a psychopath and a sociopath will basically act the same. They'll do the same things. They'll do the same types of things. But inside, they are different. A psychopath has no emotions, has no conscience, where a sociopath will feel guilt, remorse, empathy. They do have a conscience. They do know the difference uh, between right and wrong and feel that certain things are wrong and shouldn't be done. And they are able to build loving relations with others. This goes hand in hand with the fact that a sociopath Here's the difference. A sociopath is reacting to outward circumstances, 
because they were raised in a bad environment, because they were mistreated as children. They're reacting to outward circumstances. But look, those people can still be saved. If they have a conscience, if they haven't been given over to a reprobate mind, while a psychopath, or what you and I would call a reprobate, are acting on the lack of internal processes, the lack of an internal conscience. Here's what the expert wrote on page 22. Some clinicians and researchers, as well as most sociologists and criminologists who believe that the syndrome is forged entirely by social forces and early experiences, prefer the term sociopath. Whereas those, including this writer, who feel that the psychological, uh, that, who feel that psychological, biological, and genetic factors also contribute to development of the syndrome, generally use the term psychopath. In page 24, he has a quote from a psychopath who's being interviewed describing himself. And here's what he says. He says, you see, a sociopath misbehaves because he's been brought up wrong. Maybe he's got a beef with society. I've got no beef with society. I'm not harboring hostility. It's just the way I am. Yeah, I guess I'd be a psychopath. And so these people understand that it's not because, and here's what you understand, because a lot of these psychopaths, it's not that they're raised in bad environments. A lot of them have been raised by nice people. You know, good people. It's not that they were, you know, molested or, or treated wrongly, but they have chosen. Even, quote, unquote, good people can choose to reject God, reject God, reject God, and eventually cross that line. Now, we talked about, you know, the, the, the terms, defining the terms, a reprobate, a psychopath. Then we talked about how we connect the terms, why we believe they are one and the same. They are psychopath reprobates, and it's because of the fact that they are without a conscience. They lack a conscience. Their conscience has been seared. But let me just real quickly, because again, this sermon is meant to kind of lay the foundation on this. Tonight, we're going to get into the characteristics and you know of these psychopaths and the things that you can actually identify and, and look at and say, wow, this person is a psychopath, and here's why. And, and by the way, as, as we've been studying this, I've been studying it, my wife has been studying Brother Oliver has been studying it, uh, Brother Stucky looking at different things or whatever. As we've been studying it, in my own life, I've identified at least two people that for sure are psychopaths that I've had to deal with <laughs> in my life. So you, you, know, you will come across these people for sure. But let's talk about this, the types of psychopaths or the categories of reprobates and the categories of psychopaths, right? Now, on page 68, he says this, psychopaths tend to have no particular affinity or specialty for any one type of crime, but tend to try everything, all right? Now, the expert puts psychopaths into two categories, all right? He has, first of all, what I'm going to refer to as the violent criminal. That's your serial killer, rapist, child molester. And then you have what he calls a white-collar psychopath or a corporate psychopath. Now, let's talk about this. You know, when we think of psychopaths, we think, we think of the violent criminals. You know, we think of men like John Wayne Gacy, the De Plains, Illinois contractor and junior chamber of commerce man of the year who entertained children as Pogo the Clown. He had his picture taken with President Carter's wife, Rosalind, and murdered 32 young men in the 1970s, burying most of the bodies in the crawl space under his house. And by the way, John Wayne Gacy was a homosexual who raped teen boys. And you know what you're going to find in, is a common theme through these serial killers is that they're all a bunch of homos. Right. They're all a bunch of sodomites. Amen. You know, how about Kenneth Bianchi, one of the hillside stranglers who raped, tortured, and murdered dozens of women in the Los Angeles area in the 1970s and turned in his cousin and accomplice, Angelo Buono. How about Richard Ramirez? a Satan-worshipping serial killer known as the Night Stalker, who proudly described himself as evil, was convicted in 1987 of 13 murders and 31 felonies, including robbery, burglary, rape, sodomy, oral copulation, and attempted murder. How about Jeffrey Dahmer, the Milwaukee monster, who pleaded guilty to torturing, killing, and mutilating 15 men and boys and was sentenced to 15 consecutive life terms. And by the way, he was an open homosexual. He was a necrophiliac, and he found his victims at gay bars. How about Ted Bundy, the all-American serial killer, who was responsible for the murders of several dozen young women in the mid-1970s? claimed that he had read too much pornography and that a malignant entity had taken over his consciousness. And by the way, he was a rapist, a necrophiliac, and his last victim was a 12-year-old girl. She's a pedophile. 
How about uh, uh, here in page 23, he says this, many of these killers, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Henry Lee Lucas, to name but a few, have been diagnosed as psychopaths. In page 45, he says, they can torture and mutilate their victims with, a, with about the same sense of concern that we feel when we carve turkey for Thanksgiving dinner. Now, here's what you need to understand. Usually when we think of psychopaths, that's who we think of, don't we? We think of the serial killers, we think of the rapists, but here's what you need to understand. The serial killing rapist psychopaths are actually a rare minority within the psychopath community. Most psychopaths aren't killers, yet they are still extremely dangerous. The experts tell us that for every 100 normal people, there's one psychopath in most societies. And here's what you need to understand. Most of them are not killers. In fact, the ones that kill and get put in prison, they are the failures. Because a lot of them realize that they're going to go to prison for the rest of their lives. So they're going to get executed. So they choose to go ahead and uh, be predators, you know, in a way that's going to keep them from getting caught or, or, or killing. Let me read for you just a couple of things on that. On page five, he says, the majority of psychopaths manage to play uh, to their trade without murdering people. By focusing too much on the most brutal and newsworthy examples of their behavior, we run the risk of remaining blind to the larger picture. Psychopaths who don't kill, but who have a personal impact on our daily lives, we are far more likely to lose our life savings to an oily tongue swindler than our lives to a steely-eyed killer. In page 207, he says this, Psychopaths are found in every segment of society, and there is a good chance that eventually you will have a painful or humiliating encounter with one. Your best defense is to understand the nature of these human predators. Now, let me say this. We talked about the violent ones, right? And those are the ones we've heard of. Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, Richard Ramirez. But then there are the white-collar or corporate psychopaths, the, the criminals. He says this on page 2. Many psychopaths are criminals, but many others remain out of prison, using their charm and chameleon-like abilities to cut a wide swath through society and leaving a wake of ruined lives behind. On page 49, he says, Given their glibness and the facility with which they lie, it is not surprising that psychopaths successfully cheat, build, defraud, con, and manipulate people and have not the slightest compunction about doing so. They are often forthright in describing themselves as con men, hustlers, and fraud. Artists. Now, there's another book that's written by Robert Hare and another psychiatrist called Snakes and Suits. And they actually did a research study where they began to research, you know, among people, normal people, they found that for every hundred people in normal society, there's a psychopath among them. There might be a psychopath among us right now, you know. And, uh, but, here's what, but, but here's what they found. They found as they began to study professionals that are extremely successful, CEOs of companies, you know, religious successful leaders and political leaders that attain high levels in, in politics, they found that the number of psychopaths in those places went up to 25%. One out of four politicians in America is a psychopath. Is that really that hard to believe? One out of four religious leaders in America, you know, prominent leaders are psychopaths, which is why the Bible talks about false teachers, False prophets. You know, some of them are killers and some of them are rapists, but a lot of them choose to con and lie and deceive and to hurt people by staying within the lines of what will get them put in prison, but yet they do it in business or through religion or through politics. The psychopaths are put into two categories, the violent criminals and the corporate or white-collar psychopath. Now, here's what's interesting about that, because we're, we're connecting the terms, right? Psychopaths and reprobates. Well, here's what's interesting about the reprobates. Reprobates are put into two categories in the Bible as well. Did you know that? Let's look at it. The first category is a violent reprobate, a violent rapist killer. You say, well, where does the Bible say that? Go to Judges chapter number 19. Judges 19. You know it, but let's look at it together. Judges 19. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. Judges 19. In Judges 19, we find a story of reprobate psychopaths. We're going to read about Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez in the Word of God. Judges 19, verse 11. Now, in Judges 19, we have a story of a Levite who's traveling. From, he's from Ephraim. He's returning home with his concubine and with his servant. 
In Genesis 19.11, the Bible says this, And when they were uh, by Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn in unto this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. So they said, hey, let's go spend the night in Gibeah. Skip down to verse 15. And they turned aside hither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat him down in the street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to to lodging. Verse 16. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim, so they're from the same place. And he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he had lifted up his eyes, he saw the wayfaring man in the street of the city. And the old man said, Whither goest thou, and whence comest thou? And he said unto him, We are passing from Bethlehem Judah toward the side of Mount Ephraim. From thence am I, and I went to Bethlehem Judah, but I am now going to the house of the Lord. And there is no man that receiveth me to house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our asses, and there is bread and wine also for me and for my handmaid and for the young man which is with thy servants. There is no want of anything. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever, let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Look at verse 22. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, Okay, who is, what is Belial or Baal or Beelzebub? That's Satan. Remember they said to Jesus, the Pharisees said that by, by Beelzebub he casteth out devils. And he said to them, you're accusing me of having Satan. All right, the sons of Belial are sons of Satan. Remember we saw in 1 Timothy 4, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about and beat at the door and spake to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring the man uh, that came into thine house that we may know him. All right, now, when it says there that we may know him, this is not, you know, a neighborhood, uh, uh, you know, uh, fellowship committee. All right, this is not a neighborhood welcoming committee. When it says that we may know him, Okay, the word know there, it's the same word uh, that Genesis 4.1 says, you don't have to turn there, when it says, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Okay, when the Bible talks about knowing someone, in that sense, talking about a physical relationship with them. Okay, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. These sons of Belial, you know, they come out, they beat at the door, they speak to the man of the house, the old man, saying, bring forth the man that came into thine house, that we may know him. Look at verse 23. And the man, the master of the house, went out unto them and said unto them, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is come into mine house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him. So the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them. Don't miss this. And they knew her and abused her all the night until the morning when the day began to spring like a bunch of cockroaches, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was till it was light. And her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house and her hands uh, were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up and let us be going. But none answered. She was dead. Then the man took her upon an ass and the man rose up and got him unto his place. And I, I want you to understand this. These were a bunch of sodomites, homosexuals, who surrounded the house. They said, we want to know the man. And they said, no, here, take the concubine. And today you got these filthy homosexuals. Oh, well, we just don't have a desire for women. You know, we're just these quirky little, you know, we're just happy-go-lucky, and we don't want to be around women. You know, in the Bible, do you know that every sodomite went both ways? They'll rape anybody. They'll molest anybody. They'll be predators for anybody. They, these men, they came to rape him, but when they got the woman, they just raped her too, and they abused her all night, and she died. That's what a reprobate is. It's funny because that's what a psychopath is. And here's what you need to understand. It's not that the corporate psychopath wouldn't do what Ted Bundy does. It's just that they choose not to because they know that's going to give them consequences that they're not willing to live with. You know, that's why the Catholic priest 
who's a reprobate, Decided to, you know, give his life to religion so that he can just be, you know, uh, 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 you know, prey on people and be a liar and be a deceiver. But you know what? If they can molest a child, they'll do it too. Because, you look, once your conscience is seared, once you're, you're, you're given over to a reprobate mind, once there's no conscience, there's no right and wrong, any, you'll do anything. And here in Judges 19, we learn about these reprobates who want to rape a man, ended up raping a woman, ended up killing her. That's your, you know, violent psychopath. You got a violent psychopath, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, Richard Ramirez, a bunch of homosexual rapists. And what do you have? You got Judges 19. You got Genesis 19. We're going to go there in a minute. But go to the book of Matthew real quickly, Matthew chapter 13. But you know what? You also have the white-collar psychopath. You also have the corporate psychopath. You also have the psychopath that becomes a religious leader, the psychopath that becomes a, a, a CEO of a company, the psychopath that becomes a, a, a president or a, a political leader. And by the way, think about the people that are, are reprobates in the Bible that we know of. According to Romans 9, Pharaoh, in the story of Moses and Pharaoh, where Moses brings the people down, according to Romans 9, Pharaoh was a reprobate. And he was the leader of the free world at the time. According to the, uh, the, the passages on prophecy, the Antichrist, who will one day lead the one world government, is a reprobate. So notice, we see reprobates holding political uh, positions. We also see reprobates holding religious positions. Go to Matthew, you're there in Matthew 13? Look at verse 10. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10. The Pharisees were a bunch of reprobates. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10. Notice what the Bible says. And the disciples came and said unto him, the disciples are talking to Jesus. Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Remember all those parables you love to read and study? There's a reason why Jesus gave all those parables. He says, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Now, some of it was to teach and to give us pictures, you know, uh, stories. But there's a, the main reason was this. When they asked him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? Verse 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you, talking to the disciples, is, it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. But to them, it is not given. He says, they will never Come to the truth. They will never, it's not given to them. Verse 12, For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So notice, it's not that they didn't have the opportunity. They had the opportunity, but it was taken away. Verse 13, Therefore, for this reason, I speak to them in parables. Because they seeing, see not. He said, he said it's not that they don't see. They can see. They have eyes, they see, but they see not. And hearing, it's not that they can't hear. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Don't miss this. And their eyes they have closed. It's not that, it's not that they couldn't see. They chose to close their eyes. They chose to not hear. They could hear. They could see. They could believe. They chose not to, and then God says, okay, I'm going to take away your opportunity to see, to believe, to hear. He said, you want to know why I speak in parables that they can't understand? Because I don't want them to understand. I can't believe that you would teach that Jesus would want, you know, everybody should be allowed to come in to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Well, Jesus didn't think so. He said, there are some people, I don't want them to hear it. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and reach out to them anyway. Okay, because you're better than Jesus. Come on. Well, I'm just going to go ahead and give the gospel to them anyway, because I think they might say, okay, you're a better soul winner than Jesus, because Jesus said, these people are so far gone, I'm even going to speak in parables, because I don't even want them to understand the sermons when I preach them. But you're better than Jesus. You're better than God. Well, I'm not going to give up on anybody. Well, God gave up on them. Are you better than God? Amen. You better than Jesus? Well, I'm just going to give the gospel to, to them anyway, because I think, you know what? You, you are proud and arrogant. To think that you are better than God. To think when Jesus says, hey, I speak to them in parables because I don't want them to understand. Notice verse 15. 
For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are duller hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted. He said, I don't want, notice, he's saying, I don't want them to be converted. He said, less, he says, unless at any time. He said, I don't even want to, you know, uh, take the chance that they might be converted. This is Jesus. And should be converted, and I should heal them. Verse, look at verse 16. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Go to Matthew 15. Look at verse 12. Matthew 15, verse 12. Matthew chapter 15, verse 12. Matthew 15, verse 12. Notice what the Bible says about these Pharisees. They came, then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard thy saying? That's like when I preached that Orlando sermon, and people were like, Knowest thou that the Sodomites were offended after they heard this saying? Look at verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Doesn't that sound like Jude one twelve plucked up by the roots? Look, look at verse 14. Go reach out to them and see if you can get them saved. No, let them alone. Amen. That they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Go, go to Matthew 23, verse 15. Matthew 23 and verse 15. It doesn't sound like Jesus was trying to get these guys saved. It sounds like in Jude where it talks about from such, turn away. Have nothing to do with these people. As soon as you identify them as psychopaths and reprobates, get away from them. Matthew 23, verse 15. Matthew 23, verse 15. Notice what the Bible says. Matthew 23, verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. This is Jesus speaking to them. For ye compass a sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, notice, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. What were they? Sons of Belial? Now here's what's interesting about the reprobate. Pharisees, right? The white-collar psychopaths, okay? Did the Pharisees commit murder like the reprobates we saw in, Ju in Judges 19? Here's the answer to that question. Yes, they committed murder. You know who they murdered? The Lord Jesus Christ. But how did they do it? They didn't go out themselves and, do it, and did it. They didn't go out themselves and, to kill Jesus. What they did was they manipulated people and society to do their dirty work for them. See, in the same way that there are two types of psychopaths, the Ted Bundys that go out in the middle of the night, find, you know, break into people's houses and violently kill them and rape them, and we see reprobates that do that, Judges 19, Genesis 19, but we also see psychopaths who play within the rules as far as not getting put in prison, but they use their power and they use their manipulation and deceit to get their dirty work done. We also see that with reprobates. Some of them are violent reprobates, and some of them are white-collar reprobates. And look, the white-collar reprobates would, would, would kill and molest and rape as well. They just might do it differently. They just might use manipulation and their power. So what have we seen? We've seen the types, the classifications of psychopath reprobates. There are some that are violent, and there are some that are white-collar. We see that with reprobates as well. But I, I want to deal with one more thing when we're talking about the classification of, of psychopath reprobates. Now, I understand this sermon's going to be a little longer than, than what I usually preach, but just stick with me. Go, go to Genesis 19. It's the first book in the Bible. It should be fairly easy to find. I want to deal with this subject. What about psychopath reprobate children? Psychopath reprobate children. You say, can children be psychopaths? Can children be reprobates? Well, let me read to you from the book, page number 163. Here's what the expert wrote. The last decade has seen the emergence of an inescapable and terrifying reality, a dramatic surge of juvenile crime that threatens to overwhelm our social institutions. Particularly distressing is a staggering increase in drug use and crime of violence, homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, and the ever younger age at which these offenses are committed. We are constantly sickened and saddened, but no longer surprised by the reports of children under the age of 10 who are capable of the sort of mindless violence that was once reserved for hardened adult criminals. In page 165, he said this, For example, at this writing, a small town in a western state is frantically searching for ways to deal with a nine-year-old who allegedly rapes and molests other children at knife point. You say, wow, they're psychopath children. Are there psychopath reprobates? Well, go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19 is, is probably the most of the famous, you know, violent reprobate stories. 
and we're, we're going to talk probably more about it tonight, but look at Genesis 19, verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground, and he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. It's similar to the story of Genesis 19. And wash your feet, and you shall arise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the streets all night. And he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in unto him and entered into his house and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compass. That means they surrounded the house round. All right, just like, Genesis, like Judges 19. But notice, notice what it says, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compass the house round. Notice what it says, both old and young. All the people. From every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Again, talking about that physical relationship. Verse 6. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brother, do not so wickedly. But here's what I want you to understand. And of course, that's similar to the story we just read. But here's what I want you to understand. The Bible tells us that in Sodom and Gomorrah, all the people from every quarter, both old and young, every male was there. Adults and young people. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 2. Should have your place there. 2 Peter chapter 2, and look at verse number 14. We're talking about reprobate children. Is there a such thing? Could there be children that are reprobates? Well, we know that there are psychopaths that are, rep that are children. Are there psychopath reprobates that are children? And we saw in Genesis 19 that both old and young, all the people from every quarter, were coming out to rape these men. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 14, notice what the Bible says. 2 Peter 2, 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. That's probably a reference to children, that they are predators of children, that they are looking for unstable souls. In heart, they have exercised with covetous practices. Don't miss this, cursed children. Some of these reprobates have been cursed from their childhood. Psychopath reprobate children. Go to, go, go to Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now here's what's interesting about Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21 is one of the most ridiculed passages in the Bible. People who want to attack the Word of God, who want to attack Christianity, will often bring up Deuteronomy chapter number 21 as a passage to mock at and to say, that's the God you serve. But Deuteronomy 21, and I will say this, in the passage there's no reference to a reprobate, but Deuteronomy 21 makes a lot of sense when it's put in the context of psychopath children, reprobate children, cursed children. Let's read it, Deuteronomy 21, 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father, or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them. Then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of the city, and unto the gate of his place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. You know, Jeffrey Dahmer's uh, parents identified that Jeffrey Dahmer as a teenager was a drunkard with a lot of problems. It might have, they might have saved a lot of lives. They might have saved a lot of broken uh, uh, mother's hearts if they would have just, you know, if, if they could have uh, done Deuteronomy 21. Amen. You say, well, what are they supposed to do? Look at verse 21. And all the men of this city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. And people say, okay, I can't believe you serve that God. If your child is not obeying you, you're going to take them out and stone them. And stone. Listen to me. When a mom and dad, if a mom and dad would be willing to do that to their child, you've got a reprobate kid on your hands. And you, you say, what about the nine-year-old who's, who's raping other children at knife point? They should probably use Deuteronomy 21. Amen. Amen. You say, oh, you know, you believe in Deuteronomy 21. That's the God that you believe in. You know, when you put it in the context of reprobates, it makes a whole lot of sense. Because obviously parents aren't going to be just using this on a whim. They, I would imagine that they were probably using this as a threat all, all the time, right? <laughs> you clean your room or we're going to Deuteronomy 21 you. 
But, you know, how, are there any real stories in the Bible where we see where parents actually, you know, did this? We don't see that. It probably didn't happen very often. But you know what? There are some people that probably should have done it and could have done it. So what have we seen so far? Well, we've seen the classification of, of the psychopaths. We've seen the definition of the terms of a psychopath reprobate. What is it? A reprobate is someone who's rejected of God. They had the opportunity to be saved. They had the opportunity to get the truth. They chose to deny it. They chose to resist it. They chose to reject it. They chose to turn away from it, and God eventually rejected them. It's not such a kooky doctrine when you realize that very well-respected men like Jack Hiles preached it. You know? And then what's a psychopath? Well, a psychopath and a reprobate, the terms are connected because of the fact that a reprobate has a reprobate mind, has a seared conscience, has a corrupt mind, has a mind and a conscience that has been defiled, and, de defiled, and a psychopath is someone that's without conscience, that does not have a conscience that tells them anything is right or wrong. They don't have emotions like empathy, guilt, or remorse, and we'll talk about that tonight. But let's just real quickly look at the consequences of a psychopath reprobate. The consequences of a psychopath reprobate. Go back to Romans chapter number one. Romans chapter number one. You say, what, what is the consequence? What is the end game? What, it, what lies at the end for a reprobate? Well, here's what lies for them. Is that they are without hope. According to the Bible, they are without hope. Romans 1.24, Wherefore God also gave them up. Romans 1.26, For this cause God gave them up. Romans 1.28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. I said, well, what do you do with someone like this? You put them in an institution, you try to reform them, you, try to, you, get, you, know, you use psychiatry and psychology. No, you know, the Bible says the only thing that's left for them, Romans 1.32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You know, God gets to the end of, of Romans 1, the quintessential passage on reprobates. He's talking to them about reprobates. And he gets to the end and he says, there's only one thing to really do with these people. And a responsible society would do it. And I'm not saying that we should go out and do this. I'm saying a, a, a society, a government would do this if they actually wanted to protect their people. They are worthy of death. Amen. That's the only way you fix a reprobate. You take their lives. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Word of God says. Amen. That's what should be done. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Should we reach out to these people? Titus chapter 3 verse 5. I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Should we reach out to these people? Should we go out and try to get them saved? People say, I'm going to go out and get a sodomite saved. Is that something we should be doing? You can't get a sodomite saved. Look, if, if, if they're given over to that sin, it's because they've got no conscience. It's unnatural. We'll talk about that tonight. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Second to me three times. Having a form of godliness, well, well I, I gave the gospel as homosexual and he got saved. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. He said, what do you do with them? From such turn away. Listen to me. That's why we don't, we don't believe in the born that way ministry. Amen. That's why we're not going to bring them in. We're not going to bring, well, we should bring in the homosexuals and we should minister to them and we should love. No, from such turn away. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Leave them alone. That's what Jesus said. We don't minister to them. There's no hope for them. Right. Amen. They're worthy of death. From such turn away. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. You say, what do you do? What do you do with a, 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 with a reprobate? What's there to do? There's no hope. There's nothing to do. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. But these, as natural brute beasts, notice how the Bible calls them animals. They're not human anymore. But these, as natural brute beasts, as stupid animals, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. You say, what, what, should you, what do you do with a reprobate? You know, they're made to be taken and destroyed. That's really all you can do. And again, we don't do that. That's not our job. That's what society should do. That's what government should do. But that's what God says. He says they're worthy of death. Now, okay, when you look at a reprobate, at the consequence, the conclusion, the end of it, they, God says, there's no hope. Put him to death. Worthy of death. From such turn away. Well, what do the psychiatrists say about psychopaths? What do they say can be done for a psychopath? Well, let me read to you from the expert. Page 193. Here's what he said. The traditional form of psychotherapy 
including psychoanalysis, group therapy, client-centered therapy, psychodrama, have proven ineffective in the treatment of psychopathy, nor have the biological therapies, including psychosurgery, electroshock therapy, and the use of various drugs fared much better. On page 194, he says this, many writers on the subject have commented that the shortest chapter in any book on psychopathy should be the one on treatment. A one-sentence conclusion, such as no effective treatment has been found or nothing works, is the common wrap-up to scholarly reviews of the literature. On page 195, he said this, psychopaths don't feel that they have psychological or emotional problems, and they see no reason to change their behavior to conform uh, societal standards which they do not agree. See, the, psycho the, the psychiatrists get to the end of the psychopath teaching, and you know what they say? There's no hope. The Bible gets to the end of the reprobate teaching, and you know what it says? There's no hope. You ask the psychiatrist, what makes somebody a psychopath? No conscience. You ask the Bible, what makes somebody a reprobate? No conscience. We're talking about psychopath reprobates. You say, well, Pastor Jimenez, what, what's the point of the sermon? What's the point of the sermon? Here's the point of the sermon. And I want you to understand this. I'm sick and tired of Christians looking down their nose at me and preachers like me and say, well, I can't believe that you would preach that there are people who are predators, who have no conscience, who we should not reach out to, who we cannot reform. I can't believe you are so uneducated. And by the way, you know they said about the disciples you are, that they said they were ignorant and unlearned men. Right. And they said, you are so uneducated. I can't believe that you would teach that there are reprobates. But you know what's interesting is that in our culture, there are some very well-educated, well-respected, Men and women called psychiatrists. I don't necessarily believe in what they do, but if you talk to our culture as a whole, they would say, these are well-educated you know, people that help our society. And you know, all these psychiatrists have came to the realization that there is a class, a group of people in our society that we live with that are predators, that are ruthless, that have no conscience, that will stab you in the back and not give it a second thought. They they've came up with the same conclusion. The Bible Bible calls them reprobates. They call them psychopaths. Isn't it interesting that God already told us about it? Turns out you didn't have to go to Harvard. Turns out you didn't need the psychiatry, you know, degree. Turns out you didn't need all those degrees. You could have just read the Bible. Because God already, the Bible calls them reprobates. The world calls them psychopaths. You say, what are they? They're psychopath reprobates. Now tonight, we're going to learn about the characteristics of a psychopath reprobate. Because, look, the only way to protect yourself from them is to learn the things that these people do. Because you're not always going to run into the Ten Bundys, all right? Hopefully, right? You know, but you, you come across these people in your life. And by the way, let me say this. They're not all sodomites. I don't believe every, uh, uh, every reprobate's a sodomite. Now, I do believe every sodomite's a reprobate. Amen. But I don't believe that every... I don't think the Pharisees were sodomites. You know, they might have been like the Catholic priests, child molesters, you know, but what I'm saying is what makes you a reprobate is not that you're a sodomite. What makes you a reprobate is that you've been given over to a reprobate mind, that you lack a conscience. And tonight we're going to look at those characters. We're going to go through what the experts tell you. Here's what makes, identifies the way to identify a psychopath. And here's what's interesting. We're going to look at what the expert says. Here are the characteristics of a psychopath. And we're going to look at what the Bible says. Here are the characteristics of a reprobate. And we're going to see how they match perfectly, because they're psychopaths reprobates. Now, let me end with this thought. There is one difference between us and the psychiatrists. We say they're without a conscience. They say they're without a conscience. We say they have no hope. They say they have no hope. They say there is no answer. The difference is we do have an answer, because the Word of God gives you the answer to everything. You say, what's the answer to the psychopath reprobate dilemma? What's the answer to the psychopath reprobate epidemic? Well, here's what I think. I wonder, I wonder what would have happened if someone, if some soul winner was out on the streets of Milwaukee and maybe a young boy named Jeff would walk by them on his bike playing basketball at the park and they would have went to that young boy and said, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. God loves you. 
Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and you can be saved. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a young boy named Jeff before he was known as the Milwaukee monster, Jeffrey Dahmer, when he was abandoned by his mother who had her own mental problems, when he as a young teenager was literally living by himself because his father had moved out due to a divorce, when he was broken and hurt, because these people were not always evil. They were children at one point that had the opportunity to say, I just wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a boy named Jeff and said, God loves you and God wants to save you and you don't have to go down that road. I wonder how many people's lives could have been saved if somebody, if some church would have cared enough to maybe reach that dad or reach that mom and bring them into church and teach them how to raise their kids and teach them what to do. I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what would have happened if there would have been some church, some soul winner, might have maybe knocked on the door of a teenage boy named Teddy before he was known as the notorious all-American killer, Ted Bundy. A young boy who as a, 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 as a young teen was struggling with the realization when he came to the realization that the people he thought were his parents were not his parents and the girl who he thought was his sister was actually his mother, and he'd been lied to his own life, and he, and he learned how to deal with that, and he got angry and bitter towards women as a result of being lied to his own. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have reached out to a 9-year-old Teddy, to a 10-year-old Ted, to a 12 or a 13-year-old Ted, and said, hey, you know what? Man will fail you, and man will lie to you, but God loves you, and God can save you, and you can be free. I wonder if he would have got saved. How many lives could have been spared? I wonder if someone would have reached out to a young boy in Los Angeles named Richard who was being molested by his school teacher, who was being exposed to filth and pornography by his reprobate uncle. I wonder what would have happened if somebody, some soul winner, would have reached out to that Catholic home and got that mom saved and got that dad saved and got them in church and got Richard in church and taught them that we don't have to live like animals and God loves you and, 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 and these people that have molested you and done you wrong deserve to die. I wonder what would have happened if somebody would have ministered to him. Maybe he wouldn't have grown up to be the night stalker who killed many women, men, children. See, the thing is, we have the answer. It's always the same. It's the gospel. It's soul winning. It's reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ because here's what the psychiatrists say. We don't know what causes it. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know what makes them a psychopath, but we do know they reject God. They get angry at God. They get mad at God. And you know what? We can reach them before they cross that line. We can get them saved. We can show them that there are people that love them, that want to protect them, that want to preach the gospel to them, that care about them. You say, what's the hope? What's the hope for the psychopath reprobate is to reach them before they are a psychopath reprobate. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.